Good evening and welcome to New Milton Baptist Church as we gather to celebrate the church's 110th anniversary. Hear the word of God. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labour in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. For he grants sleep to those he loves. Let's pray. Father God, as we gather to worship you tonight, to give thanks for 110 years of the life of this church. So Father, we come with gratitude to you because it's you who have built this church. It's you who have worked in the hearts of the people. It's you who brought us together. And as we come, so we give you our thanks and our praise. As we come together in and through Jesus. Jesus, God made flesh, in whom we have salvation. In whom we have entrance to heaven. In whom we have a new and living way back to you. And we come to worship to give you our thanks and praise, to worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all through Jesus. The Father who adopted us, the Saviour who made it possible, and the Spirit who brings us together and works in the lives of each one of your children. So we come to worship you, the triune God, Yet as we, as we seek to worship, coming into the presence of one, of one who is holy, so we recognise that we have thought, said and done things that we shouldn't. So we come, not hiding anything, but confessing our sins to you. Confessing the wrong things that we've said, done and thought. Confessing the things that we should have done, but didn't. So we bring to you our failures, our slips and falls, but even as we confess them, so we know and experience that the blood of Jesus cleanses us, purifies us from all sin, making us fit to stand in your presence, making us fit to worship. So receive our thanks. Receive our praise. Draw close to us, we pray, that we might draw near to you tonight. Father, we thank you. In that precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, being our anniversary service, I'm taking a break from Ephesians for a week. And the reading that we're going to take tonight is from Matthew chapter 16, reading verses 13 to 19. So hear the word of God. When, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered him, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. May God bless his word to us tonight. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you for that word the history of that encounter with Jesus and his disciples in the region of Caesarea Philippi. Peter confessed 
who Jesus is, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And we come, confessing the same, inviting you to speak into our lives, to reveal to, to us what we need to hear tonight. Come Holy Spirit, we pray, have free reign in our lives and among us, that we might be drawn ever closer to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labour in vain. As with everything else in 2020, this is an unusual church anniversary. Because of the COVID pandemic, we're unable to have a tea or any other kind of social celebration. And for the same reason, we can't have a visiting speaker. So I'm afraid that you've got me. And with it being our anniversary, it seemed right to look at the question of building the church. 110 years ago, our brothers and sisters at Ashley decided to plant a church in New Milton. And so the work began here. Our spiritual forebears had the vision to build a church. Not a building. The building is only the house in which we meet. Their vision was to build a church. A congregation. Because that's what the New Testament word translated as church means literally. It's the Greek word ecclesia meaning the called out ones, those whom God has called together out of the world to be his people. And that's what the church is. Not a building, not an organisation or a denomination, but those people God has called together to be his people in any particular place. Those two verses from Psalm 127 that we heard at the beginning are often read at church anniversaries and it comes both as a warning and as an encouragement. It comes as a warning. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labour in vain. This psalm was written by Solomon, the son of King David. And as we know, Solomon knew all about building because he was the one who was called to build the first temple in Jerusalem. Unless the Lord builds the house, unless God is in the project, our plans will come to nothing. David, Solomon's father, desired to build a temple, but God forbade him. The building of the temple had to wait for Solomon. And then with the coming of Jesus, a physical temple was no longer required. The temple in Jerusalem had been the place of sacrifice, where animals were slaughtered as offerings for sin. With the coming of Jesus and his self-sacrifice on the cross, his death, followed by his resurrection, made full and final atonement for sin, for all human sin. So the temple was no longer needed. Jesus was building something greater. But unless the Lord builds the house, those that seek to build it labour in vain. Jesus is building his church, the gathering of his people, those whose sins have been forgiven, those who've been called out of the world to be his people. And as his people together, we form a temple, not built with physical stones, but built of living stones. The sacrifice for sins has been made. Jesus has offered himself for our forgiveness to reconcile us to God. And he calls us together to build with him. He said in that reading from Matthew, I will build my church, my congregation, and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, all the powers of darkness will not overcome it. They will not prevail against it. And that's a statement of fact. 
The house that God builds, the house, the church, the congregation that Jesus is building will be built. And the gates of hell will not prevent it. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labour in vain. But if he does, even the gates of hell cannot overcome it. The church that Jesus is building is built on a firm foundation, on a rock. And the rock on which Jesus is building is solid. Contrary to what some people say, that rock isn't Peter. When Jesus said this, Peter was the least rock-like character you could imagine. When Jesus named him, as he was then, it was a joke. But in calling him Peter, he looked forward to God, what God was going to do in Peter's life. And that was based on the rock that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 16. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. As Luther and the reformers pointed out, the rock, this rock, was not Peter himself. Jesus was speaking directly to Peter. He didn't say, you are Peter, and on you I will build my church. What he did say was, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The rock that Jesus was talking about was what Peter said. And this is the rock-solid foundation of the church and the lives of God's people. So what did Peter say? You are the Messiah, the Christ, God's anointed deliverer. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Peter recognised the true identity of Jesus. And this recognition has huge ramifications for us. Jesus is the Messiah. He is God's anointed deliverer, promised and prophesied throughout the Old Testament. This meant that Jesus is the one that Isaiah called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. That's in Isaiah 9. He was so much more than a prophet. He's the one, as Isaiah said, is the Mighty God. Jesus is God made flesh, God with us, Emmanuel. All the prophecies of, of the Messiah were fulfilled in Jesus. Again, Isaiah prophesied that Jesus, the Messiah, would be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Peter recognised this, and these prophecies and many more were fulfilled in Jesus. He was pierced on the cross by the nails, by the thorns and by the spear. And this was for our transgressions, for your sins and mine. He was crushed for our iniquities. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us was killed for you and for me. He made himself the offering for our sins. He paid the penalties that we earned when we transgressed God's law of love. The punishment, the horrors of the cross that he chose to endure for us bring us peace. Peace with God. His sufferings make us whole and by his wounds we are healed. And all this was fulfilled for us in Jesus. Peter's confession of faith, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, was momentous. Peter recognized Jesus for who he is, God the savior. And Jesus not only accepted what Peter said, he replied, blessed are you, Simon son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. This was revealed to him by God. It was not his own idea, 
this recognition of Jesus for who he is, is the foundation, the rock on which Jesus would build his church. This recognition of who Jesus is, is the solid foundation of the Christian faith. And this, is the re the rec this recognition is what makes us Christians. The recognize, recognition of Jesus for who he is means that we have to act on it. Jesus is God and that invests in him ultimate authority. What Jesus says goes. As he said of himself, the Son of Man, and that's his favourite title for himself, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And this calls for a response. When we recognise Jesus for who he is, that he gave his life for us, for our ransom, for our ransom, for our transgressions and sins, we can't just let that go. It demands a response. Well, that response can be to choose to ignore or reject him, to spurn his self-sacrifice for you and for me. And in doing so, we'll bear the consequences of doing that. Or we can choose to give him his rightful place in our lives as Lord and God, as Saviour and King. We can accept the gift of forgiveness and life, which is what his suffering brought for us. And we can enter into the healing and the peace that he offers. The fact that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the one who is wonderful, the one who is Counselor, Mighty God, the one who is Father of Eternity and Prince of Peace, is the rock-solid foundation of the Christian faith and the Church of Jesus Christ. And those who accept this, those who choose to repent, acknowledging and giving him his rightful place in our lives, those who believe, those who commit themselves entirely to him, receive all the benefits that he came to bring. Adoption as God's children, entrance to heaven, a new relationship with God, and also a new relationship with other Christians, with those who likewise accept him. Peter's confession is rock solid, the foundation of all we believe. It's essential because, it's, because it makes those who believe Christian. Without it, there is nothing. Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church. On this rock solid truth, the whole faith rests. And as people hear the gospel, that Jesus is God, that he died for our sins and God raised him from the dead. As they hear and believe and accept this for themselves. So Jesus builds them into his church, into his congregation, into the assembly of his people. The message that the church, that we have to proclaim is their call to repent and believe. And when we play our part, when we share our faith with others, those who hear are engaging not with us, but with Jesus. When we share our faith, when we tell the message, they encounter Jesus himself. When we proclaim Jesus for who he is, the Messiah, the Saviour, the Son of the living God, Jesus builds his church. An encounter with the message is an encounter with him. He is the living word. He is God. We share our faith. We live as his disciples and he builds his church. He builds it on this rock solid foundation and on that foundation alone. Unless the Lord builds the house, 
the builders labour in vain. The church, the Christian faith, is built on this foundation and on this foundation alone. If we try to build the church on social work, on social justice, or on any other thing, anything other than this foundation and this message, then we do not build the church at all. The church is built out of living stones. Those who believe, who recognise Jesus for who he is, and have committed themselves to him. The church is made up of those who believe and have been born again, born of the Spirit, built into the church by Jesus himself. And we dare not try to build on any other foundation. The church is not a political pressure group, a food bank or a social service. It is not a social club, a charitable institution or anything else. It's the body of Christ built on, on the foundation of Jesus himself, the chief cornerstone. It exists to, to make disciples, to bring others to Jesus. And anything it is, or anything it does, must come out of that, or it's not the church at all. Any good works we do must come out of that fact, and, that, and off from that foundation. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labour in vain. And it is built on this foundation. The recognition of Jesus for who he is. And on our response in repentance and faith to him and his sacrifice for our sins. If we try to make the church anything else. Or if we try to build it in any other way. Then God is not building the house and our labour is in vain. God has given us his word. His will is revealed in it. And if we take any other route, if we try to set his word aside or reinterpret it, we begin to move the building off its foundation. And that's dangerous. If we move the building, if we move the church off its foundation, off the foundation of Jesus Christ, the one who is the Messiah, the Saviour who died for us and rose again, the Son of the living God. The danger is that we're building on no foundation at all. And in the end, whatever we build, whatever we build that is not built solidly on an acceptance of who Jesus is and what he's done for us, is doomed to collapse. To deny Jesus' deity, to deny sin and its consequences or to deny the efficacy of Jesus' sacrifice for sin is to build nothing and whatever we try to do is doomed to failure and collapse. My dear friends, 110 years ago our forebears began a work here, a work that was built firmly on the foundation of Jesus Christ the Messiah, the Saviour, the Son of the Living God. They built solidly on this foundation. They proclaimed the message of salvation, the call to believe, to accept Jesus as Saviour and Lord, the call to repent. And we stand on what they built so faithfully. We build on their work, and if we will take the call to share our faith with others, to proclaim Jesus as Lord, then Jesus will build his church through us. Our task now is to pray and to witness, to share our faith with others and batter on the doors of heaven for their souls. Then our work will be of value. Then our work will be building on the rock-solid foundation. Peter declared it. We believe it. So let's each play our part. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. 
We thank you for Jesus. Jesus who is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus who gave himself on the cross for our sins. Who allowed his body to be broken and his blood shed. That we might be forgiven, that our sins might be atoned for. That we be, might, might be put right with you. And Father, we come with such gratitude to you. For we deserve nothing from you. Yet you have chosen to give us everything. Simply because we have believed and received. And so Father, we commit ourselves to you afresh. We commit ourselves to you, our Saviour God. To live and to serve you and you alone. Father, we, we ask you to build your church through us. And we ask it in that precious and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, what else could I read? But Stuart Townend's great hymn, In Christ Alone. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when strivings cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. Here, in the death of Christ, I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here, in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Amen. And I trust you stand on that firm foundation too. Now we're going to bring our prayers for others. And we begin by praying for our church. So let's pray. Father God, as we come to you on this church anniversary, so we come to you to give thanks to you for 110 years of this church in this place. 110 years of the gospel being preached. 110 years of your faithfulness to us. And we praise you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you brought this church into being. And we ask, Father, that you would keep this church faithful. Faithful to your message, faithful to you, faithful to your word. Faithful and standing and building on the confession that Peter made. That Jesus is the Messiah, God the Saviour, who gave himself for us and is building his church on that foundation. Father, we pray for this church in the coming months and years during this COVID lockdown, or at least the restrictions. Father, we pray that you would keep us faithful to you, that you keep us together, and that you would use us. Please use us to spread your gospel. Put us in places where we can share our faith with others, with our friends, with our family, with our neighbours, with those who we meet. We might point them to you, the living God and Jesus, our Saviour. Father, we ask that you would breathe your spirit into us afresh, that you would revive this church, revive the work here, 
that we might be used to bring many to salvation, to point many to you. Father, please work in the lives of each and every one of us that we might be your faithful people, that we might be faithful disciples living up to our confession of faith. Father, we pray for this church and its future. And we pray especially for the children, the young people, that they might hear the truth about Jesus. That as they hear, they might be drawn to you. That they would see in us the reality of Jesus Christ. That they might be pointed to you and receive him for themselves. And Father, we pray for the church throughout this United Kingdom. We pray, Father, for each and every church that names the name of Jesus. We pray especially for those that are moving off the foundation, those who are taking a more liberal view of the word, those who are giving up on the gospel and preaching a false gospel. Father, we ask that you would bring them to repentance. And if any of us are slipping, Father, we pray that you would bring us to repentance, that we might come back to the truth, that we might preach the gospel in its fullness that we might see churches revived and people coming to salvation. Father, revive your church throughout this land that the people of this country who need to hear about Jesus may be given the opportunity to respond. Please, Lord Jesus, build your church in this land. And Father, we pray for other matters further afield. And in the face of the, of the COVID virus, in the face of the civil wars in Syria, in Nigeria, in different parts of the world which are at war. So Father, we pray for all those who have been forced to refugee, those who are living in refugee camps, those who are seeking refuge from persecution, who are seeking refuge from war. Father, we pray for them. We pray, Father, that they might find with your people the truth about Jesus that we might open our hearts and open our wallets that we might welcome those who need to hear about Jesus those who are suffering that we might help them that we might provide shelter that we might meet their needs and in doing so Father point them to you Father we pray for all those charities all those who are working among the refugees and the poor, all those charities that are working for all different good causes but have lost money because of the COVID pandemic. Father, we pray that you would wake us up, that we might open our wallets and purses to those who, who need it, that we might put our money where our mouth is and not just believe rightly but live rightly, that we might serve you with all that we are, and so, Father, we bring to you all our needs, all our concerns. Father, we bring to you all those that we're concerned about, entrusting them and all our prayers into your almighty hands, for you can do more than all we could ever ask or imagine. So receive our thanks and our praise in that precious name of Jesus. Amen. And let's draw all our prayers together as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now a blessing from Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen and God bless you.